Okay, it is 6.15 and a half. So we're a little late. Sorry, we're starting late. No, we're not late, and you are not late either. It's a good time to be in God's house. It's a good time to focus upon what he has for his people. Thank you all for being here. We'll begin our time together, and uh, if those come in a little later, we'll catch them up as well. Thank you all for making time to be a part of a Wednesday night study series entitled Church and Vision. So let's pray together, and uh, we'll, we'll move right into this. Again, thank you guys for being here. Father, thank you for... Uh, drawing us together to your house today. Uh, thank you for this time of fellowship around the dinner table you gave us. Thank you for creating table fellowship among our, our body. Uh, Father, uh, right now we just want to thank you for Jesus. We, we understand, probably not as deep as we should, but we understand uh, how Scripture describes your sacrifice and uh, giving us your Son that we might know you as an indescribable blessing. And so, Father, may we not waste that blessing tonight as we lean in to where you're at work in our lives. And we want to be careful to follow you. And we ask that your son, Jesus, will be exalted tonight. In his precious name we pray. And together we said. Amen. So there is this neat little uh, British cartoon titled Sarah and Duck. And Sarah and Duck chronicles the journeys of a little girl and her pet duck throughout all the events of life. Uh, because we have a five-year-old five girl by the name of Sarah Joy, she's grown very fond of this cartoon titled Sarah and Doug. Are there any parents that know Sarah and Doug? Thank you, Eric and Aaron. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it has a neat little theme song that I'd like for Eric and Aaron to come up and help me sing right now. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a fun little story, but I bring it up uh, because uh, of the storyline. The storyline depicts that wherever Sarah is, there is her duck. They do everything together. Well, I, I want to ask you to consider, not in an animated way or in a frivolous way, but I want you to consider this phrase, church and vision, as, not as an individual clinging to simply a man-made vision, but as the body of Christ clinging to that which Christ has called them to be and to become and to do. So much so that much like the Chronicle cartoon, could it be that church and vision does not part company at any time, but always stays true uh, to what God has, has indicated for his people. So I, I would ask you to consider the phrase church and vision to be something more than just a series title uh, that we're uh, looking at on Wednesday nights, but I ask you to consider that couplet to be something of a of a prophetic nature of the church that we would consistently never take a step without saying, God, what is your vision for us and what would you have us to do? And we would never consider a decision without saying, God, how would this decision better promote your vision for us? Or would this decision, if it were affirmed, get in the way of your vision? So wouldn't it be incredible that wherever we would travel and however our lives as a body of believers would be chronicled, that there would be no separation. Just as there is in the British cartoon, Sarah and Doug, there's no separation. They do everything together. Could it be that with church and vision, everything is done in sync together as we do not follow the whims of man, but we follow the heart of Jesus to make absolutely certain that we're right on point with where Jesus has us. So this is our series for these Wednesday nights. We're looking at church and vision. I welcome you in to part two. And as we begin... We're going to review the vision statement from last week. Now, our teaching on these weeks of church and vision would not represent a, a, an organized uh, exegetical Bible study that I really enjoy teaching along with all the other teachers here. But this is a, a different type of journey, but nonetheless a very important journey where we are making absolutely certain that we understand where God has us directed. So uh, we've already established uh, last Wednesday night and this past weekend at the uh, diaconate retreat this vision, we exist as a community of faith to extend the love of Christ and his kingdom in Virginia Beach and to the world. This vision statement lends to us three values. So in your notes, if you want to uh, pin these values down, they're for you uh, in this statement highlighted. Community, faith, and love. We began our six-week study last week looking at the, the dynamic and the essential of community within the vision statement, and more importantly, within our church body. We're going to conclude 
uh, our focus on community tonight, and then we'll spend two weeks each on faith and love in the, in the coming four weeks. So let's, uh, let's have a conversation, and we're going to have actually a conversation with several points of focus. Last week, we defined reality. Tonight, we're going to pick up our conversation with uh, rediscovering membership, and there'll be four of the conversations uh, I trust the Lord's hand in guiding us to tonight. But we've defined reality. We spent uh, a good 40 minutes last week determining the state of the culture wherein the church is placed. And now we're going to take a fresh look and maybe even a, a rediscovery uh, to the idea of membership and exactly what membership should look like first and foremost in the kingdom of Christ and secondly, as a result of that, in the local church. So let's take a moment to, to rediscover our membership as people in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of Christ, but also as members in the local church. Uh, to have a statement that would say we believe in community, faith, and love is to say that we believe community represents that membership into the kingdom that allows someone to align themselves in a journey of faith so that they're developing from conversion to being a minister for Jesus. And then the third value, mission, allows that one to move from membership to live life as a minister so that they're sent out on mission for Christ. So we have these three terms, community, faith, and love, that correlates with three pieces of an equipping model, member, minister, mission. Are we suited as a body of believers in our, in our vision, in our task, in, in our present assignments to take a life whose faith has been placed in Jesus and to bring them into meaningful membership, community, to, so that their life is developing from conversion to living as a minister, one who represents the hands and feet of Jesus, and then thirdly, so that they've moved out on mission representing the love of Christ in everything that they do. So we're looking at this significant picture of community as it uh, represents member or membership in the kingdom and in the local body of Christ. For community to be that contagious interrelatedness of God's people that both fosters unity according to Ephesians chapter 4, and from that unity and environment wherein we are equipped to build up the body of Christ in the works of ministry so that we are one new man in the fullness of Christ. You know the church is called the one new man. Represented in Scripture as the Gentiles and Jews coming together in Ephesians 4, but played out in the local body of believers as a joined, redeemed community living out Jesus to the world. And that community has to be an incredibly develop community first on what I like to call the culture of invitation. So to rediscover membership is to first say to ourselves, how, to, how do we continually develop a culture of invitation? You may say, Pastor, what is this culture of invitation within the church? Last week we defined a church culture as that which defines uh, our, what guides us and what develops our convictions, what helps us to make decisions. All of that involves church culture. Church culture is not bad. It truly defines uh, how God has formed the local body so that we move forward under his leadership. Part of that culture would be a culture of invitation, meaning that we are very careful for the doors of the church to be wide open to invite all in who need to know Christ. And I believe that would include absolutely everyone. There is no filter at the front door of the true body of believers because Jesus said, come. And his local body says, come, we would love to have you as a part of our experience in walking with Christ. So therein lies the culture of invitation. But I want to submit this to you uh, uh, this evening. It would be uh, impossible to have a culture of invitation without a supporting culture of welcome. I'll share a scripture verse here with you from Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. This will be uh, a repeat from the uh, diaconate retreat we had this past weekend. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, very simply and clearly says, pursue hospitality. The term in the Greek, hospitality, comes from a compound word that actually means this, to treat a stranger like a brother. 
Isn't that a beautiful word? Philoexnos is the Greek term. Indicating that our love should represent such a hospitality that I would hold to a stranger with the same emphasis of agape love as I would hold to a brother or sister in Christ. And Scripture says, pursue that hospitality. So I, I ask you this question, is it possible that we can develop a culture of invitation where we're constantly having doors open, inviting people in, supported by a culture of hospitality wherein we're treating all people like brothers and sisters? Is it possible to have that culture through simple programming and assignments or better through lifestyle? And I believe we would say lifestyle. The programming and the assignments give support to the lifestyle but are never designed to replace the lifestyle. Every se segment of church development, every piece of church life in the organizational scheme of things always serves to encourage the life but never to replace the life of the church. Always to encourage that our step forward should be lifestyle invitation and welcome. And what I love about that piece of the culture, uh, and there, there is a question we would ask, is this the practice of an idea or an aspiration or is this culture? And what I love about invitation and welcome becoming culture is that it equals partnership. Now here's what this means. Our desire to bring people into a community, follow me, to a community that will lead someone to faith and love, meaning leading someone to living a life, a full life of faith, being a minister for Christ, resulting in a life of demonstrating Christ, love, being on mission. If it's our desire that we want to see people grow in that type of discipleship, then it must, it, it must prove or conclude our desire is to see people who potentially could be in partnership with us. Is it not amazing that we would invite someone to be a part of something much larger than themselves as opposed to inviting someone to simply join a program or come and sit and receive when there are people who receive invitations to come and sit and receive ad infinitum? But how incredible it would be to say, listen, we are, we are here as a body of believers to make a difference in Virginia Beach and to the world. Remember the vision statement? We, we exist as a community of faith to extend the love of Christ and his kingdom in our city, in Virginia Beach, and to the world. And would it not be phenomenal to culture a, a spirit of invitation, to have a culture of invitation wherein we see every person visiting as potentially a member in the mission, a partner in the mission, as opposed to simply someone who's placed? Or could it be that we would never desire people to come and just be placed in the church, but actually be, to be drawn into meaningful participation so that they can become in partnership with what Christ is doing here. Now this is what I love about partnership. It does create community. That significance of inviting people in to be a part of something larger than themselves does lend the partnership to community. Real community is defined by an interrelatedness wherein each one is supporting the other for a common cause, a common purpose. Our common purpose is Jesus, to say it simply. To say it as Jesus said it, our common purpose is to disciple people to live for Jesus. To say it even more distinct than that with the vision he's given us, our common purpose is to disciple people to live for Jesus through inviting them in to be a part of a community of membership in the kingdom so that they can develop to serve as ministers so that they can go out and be on mission for Christ. So the invitation and welcome forms a culture of invitation that lends to partnership that creates community. And this is what I love about this. When you have community, the back door is closed. When someone is engaged in true community, likely will be their involvement in partnership and unlikely, although it could happen, would be their silent exit. One of the most interesting things against a healthy body of believers is that there would be a silent exit of people that no one has caught the awareness of. Wherein one might ask some six months later after missing someone, well, where is this person or what's happened to that family? Within three to six months, likely that question is too late unless there is a strong reconcili reconciliation effort to bring that one back in. But when that one is brought in on the front end with the goal of every member, hey, you could be a partner with us in what God's called us to do in Virginia Beach, then you likely do not let go of a partner so easily. 
With participants, they tend to blend. Partners tend to make us prioritize what's important. And what is important is every single person becoming a piece of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment here. But this is what happens when there is no partnership. You could have a semblance of community, but notice that the closed back door fades. And even though the back door is there, this approach simply lengthens the hallway to the back door. Eventually, there could be that absence uh, simply because uh, the partnership is not present. And so community might be felt, but community is just leading to a long hallway to a back door that's propped open. I say, and I know you say this as well, let's close the back door by saying to every person that even comes close to the front door, we want you to be a part of something big that God is doing here. And the language of that is culture of invitation supported by welcome that equals partnership. So that is the, uh, the rediscovery of membership. This is looking at membership as more than just saying, hey, let's get a new member class and send new members to the new member class and then on to a Sunday school. This is saying in that process, not absent of that process, in that process, our goal is not that they be a member and then subsequently a member of a class. Our goal is that they become involved in an equipping process that allows them to be partners with us in the mission of the church. That's the equipping nature of the church. Come be a part of what we're doing, not come and, 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 and receive what a few we're doing, but God, come be a part of what we're doing. And that's an exciting prospect. So we've rediscovered membership in that way. Now, I want to take you for just a brief moment to a second conversation of the five, or a third conversation for this journey, second tonight. Now we're going to move to an understanding of the need of man. We've had a conversation about the reality of our society. We're in the church's place. We just had a conversation about rediscovering membership. Now I'd like to have a conversation with you as God directs concerning uh, the need of man, our understanding of the need of man. This is a vital conversation uh, simply because of how the church is responsible for where man has found himself placed in life. Now, consider for just a moment the need of man. I want to look at this with you uh, first from the perspective of what God intended. If you know the beginning of creation, God intended that man would be a life of dignity. I use that word carefully, for therein lies how God has allowed his holy word to appraise man. In Psalms chapter 8, uh, who is man that thou art mindful of them, the psalmist saying. You've made him a little lower than the angels, and you've, you've crowned him to rule over creation. God has desired that man have dignity. God, God's intention is that man is created in his image to bring him glory and to be in perfect fellowship with him. That's what God has intended. What has sin caused? Romans chapter 3, verse 23, sin has caused a fall. So God has desired that we all would be created in his image and be a life of dignity, but sin has corrupted that that life and sin has caused a fall. How does man view self? This is where we really need to understand the function and the role of the church. How does man view himself or how does mankind view him or herself? Lifeway research reveals that 71% of Americans believe that they must contribute to their own salvation. 71% of Americans believe they must contribute to their own salvation. Either that statistic is due to a very low view of salvation or a very high view of man's righteousness on his own. And I believe it to be a combination of both. But do not forget the great William Temple wrote, the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is our sin. And yet there are many who have possibly bought into statements from... Uh, Modern thinkers like Oprah Winfrey or even taglines like Home Depot has, we will help you do this. And I fear sometimes that people look at the church as a place that will help me be good enough for God. And I think a lot of times that's why entrance into the church is not an entrance into salvation and redemption to be a part of something God is doing, but an entrance into a place that would just make me better at who I already am. 
I need to be a better husband so I'll become a part of a church so that I can be a better husband or a, a, a better father. Or I, I want success in my business. So I want to become a part of the church so that I can become a better person and, and maybe more successful. And all the while, the gospel proclaims that true salvation is coming to the end of our fallen self and allowing Jesus to make us brand new. And we know that's the gospel, but if that's not believed on the front end of how we engage members, then likely the gospel has been forgotten. And so to understand the need of man is to understand man's need to be completely and fully without reservation reconciled to God. I listen uh, to these words often from 2 Corinthians 5, and I want to read these to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. All the old things have passed, and look, new things have come. Is there anyone in the house glad that God has made you a new creation in Christ? I certainly am. Probably not as half as glad as the people who know me are. Because I was broken before Jesus, and Jesus made me whole. Changed me completely. He's still changing me. I hope that if, if you're in a close relationship with me, I hope that in the next 12 months you can tell how Jesus is changing me. What, the pastor's not perfectly finished? Let's, we might need to trade him in for another one that's perfectly finished. No, no, we are not finished. Uh, one of the dear ladies at First Baptist, as we were announcing our departure about a year ago, came up and said, her name is Barbara Dodson, and she said, my greatest joy is watching my pastor grow in the faith. And I thought, well, I am glad it was obvious because I want that to be obvious because we're brand new in Christ. And he grows us and strengthens us and develops us each day. But I want you to notice how this verse of a new creation is contexted in Scripture. After that great announcement on a new creation, verse 18, now everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, comma, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Scripture didn't say, God in Christ has reconciled you. For had that been the extent of the conversation, we are slapping high five and we're saying, we've got it made. It's all done. But God's Holy Spirit put a comma, not a period, not even a semicolon, comma. And so there's no change of thought. There's just a brief redirection. God's reconciled you, comma, and now you have the ministry of reconciliation. You have the ministry of reconciliation. What is this ministry? Late in this passage, it tells us we've been given the message of reconciliation, which is the core of the ministry. And the message is the gospel of Jesus. Man views himself, according to proper statistics, as someone totally enabled on their own to be right. The gospel tells us we can only be right through Jesus. And now we have the ministry to help others know and to grow in that understanding of being made new. So with a reflection of the need of man, what would an equipping model look like that responds to man? Equipping model represents here a tangible process of discipleship. How can a church reflecting the gospel encourage a life from member, does anyone remember the second M? Minister, and on to mission. How can a church develop a community that invites, with Jesus-given hospitality, uh, people into that community to be a member of the kingdom of Christ and the local church, to be discipled as a minister, be in the hands and feet of Jesus so that they can be sent out on a mission what would that equipping model become as it reflects the gospel? The equipping model would have three priorities. The priority or the responsibility to see lives mended and restored. I'm just curious, for those who know Jesus personally, is there any among us who know Jesus who did not have to be mended and restored when they came to Christ? Okay, rhetorical, obviously that's a rhetorical question. Uh, if your hand went up, uh, I'll need to have some conversation with you in just a moment. Um, we were in desperate need of mending and restoring. But you know what? I remember the day that I knew my salvation was confirmed in Christ. And I'm glad that there was a wise man 
my father and some other mentors, particularly a man by the name of Randy Foote, who looked at me as a growing junior and senior in high school and said, you know, I, I want to spend some time with you, Ken. And I loved jogging and running. He loved that type of athleticism. So he and I would exercise together. Then we would find some uh, 5Ks to do together. And just a great man of encouragement. And what he taught me in his tutelage over my life, along with my father and other was that I needed to be more established in my faith to make certain that there is a foundation of the gospel under my feet that not only calls me to reconciliation, but sends me out with the ministry of reconciliation. For therein alone lies the fullness of my experience with Jesus. I can't have a full experience with Jesus if I say, you know what, Jesus? I want half of your deal of salvation. I want the half that benefits me, but not the half that includes the benefit my redeemed life could be to your church, because that's just going to be busy and hard work. No, that's, that's not possible. Mending and restoring always leads to establishing and laying a foundation, which leads ultimately to preparing and training to send out. And these three offers of how an equipping ministry responds to the need of man, the mending and restoring is the membership of the community. The community must be a mending and restoring community. The other pieces we're going to look at in the next few weeks, but I want to spend just a few moments on the mending and restoring ministry of the community of the church. Remember, we're looking at the community and the equipping model of the community through the reflection of the gospel and the ultimate, the ultimate response to the need of man from the community of faith that is bringing in those to become members of the body of Christ and the local church. The immediate response is this this repair of what is broken. Mending and restoring reflects to fix what is broken. Now this is a reflection of a Greek term that you find all throughout Scripture, used in many places in the Old and the New Testament. From the Old Testament, we get this translation through the Septuagint into the Greek. From the New Testament, we get it straight from the Aramaic or the Greek. And there are many usages of this word equip. One particular usage is Ezra chapter 4, verse 12, wherein the word equip means to fix what is broken. That same word equip is what we are to be doing in the body of Christ to, to see each other built up. The first step of equipping is not that I might become a great servant of the Lord. The first step in equipping in a person's life is that they would have repaired what's been broken. For that is the meaning of the term kartartizo which is now why I just say equip. Uh, this very complex word in the Greek actually means uh, equip, but in certain passages, it specifically points to fixing what is broken, repairing what is broken. So the, the call of the community of faith as it reflects the need of man in the gospel is to, is to see lives mended and restored, which means to fix what is broken. But also this word, Cartartizo, mend and restore, means to bring back into proper alignment. So where this phrase, fix what is broken, reflects salvation, meaning that we are called to see people saved and redeemed in the body of Christ, this phrase, to bring back into proper alignment, actually reflects a restoration. Those of faith who've fallen away and need to be brought back in. So what does mending and restoring mean if we're to be an equipping church that has a community that is contagious, built on a culture of invitation, drawing mankind in, proclaiming, come be a part of who we are and what God is doing here and using us to, to, to change the world. Come be a part. When we say come be a part, there's absolutely no telling who will walk through the door. It could be someone who needs to have fixed what has been broken in their life, meaning they don't know Jesus. I know this is not a new announcement, but when we develop a culture of invitation, lost people will come to church and will come to church a lot. And we must say to ourselves, they are potentially to be partners with us. So let's minister to them where they are, are experiencing brokenness and let's see Jesus fix this. I think sometimes it might feel easier if God would just bring saved people who are already fixed into the church. But that's not his salvation, is it? He didn't, he didn't keep me away till I was fixed. He said, hey, just bring all your stuff. Bring all your stuff and lay it at my feet. And when people visit, if there's someone in need of salvation, needing to have fixed what is broken, we have to put our arms around them and say, we want to walk you to Jesus so you can lay down all your stuff. And you, you know as well as I do, people who haven't met Jesus yet, 
will pick their stuff right back up. And you have to walk right back with them again. I, I'm, I'm teaching in this way so that we'll understand if we really want to be a church of community, it will be messy at times. Because we're inviting people in who are broken and we want to see them fixed. Translated here for salvation. I, I'm pulling this translation of the term equipped from the Old Testament, the book of Ezra, to be, to, to be clear, where in Ezra chapter 4, verse 12, Ezra said, I saw the walls and they were rumbled and there were holes in the wall. It was not really a wall, it was broken. And scripture says that Ezra looked at that and, and God, cartartizo, God led Ezra to see the wall fixed and restored. So we get the emphasis of salvation from that for the New Testament. Lives needing to be fixed and, and saved and redeemed to fix what is broken. When we say we want to be a church that mends and restores, I'll take you back to that second statement. This means to bring back into proper alignment. All throughout Scripture, there are verses like Psalm 68 and 9 that tells us God restores what has been left in languish and in, and in brokenness. God restores that which has been pulled apart. So to mend and restore with the word equip means to save, to, to fix what was broken, but it also means to bring back into proper alignment. When a church says we want to have a culture of invitation and the doors are wide open, there'll be people coming in who are believers who are coming in really, really confused about Jesus, about the Bible, or maybe broken in their own life, maybe visiting without their family because the family's been broken, maybe coming with so much that they need to work through, even though they're children of God and their faith is in Jesus, there is a great need for restoration in that realignment with Christ. So maybe you know what it's like and remember vaguely what it was like to not know Jesus and then to receive his grace. But also, maybe we know that even as a part of the church, maybe we remember some of those times that our life was out of alignment. And it was the community of God's people that helped us get back in alignment. Well, that's a part of the community. That's a part of not only salvation, but restoration. And then there's a third statement, wherein we have this word equip that teaches about the mending and restoring nature of community to supply what is lacking. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 3.10, Oh, that we may supply, Thessalonica, what is lacking in your faith. Well, this would be the term foundation. So salvation, fix what is broken. Restoration, bring it back into proper alignment. Foundation, wow, to complete what is lacking, which is discipleship, leading people to a deeper understanding. I'm on question 17 here, discussion group leaders. It's a very important question. How can a church best mend and restore? How can a church best mend and restore? When we see at the front of our ministry, at the forefront of relationships, the, the membership, the welcoming into the community, and we, we see that there are many, many needs in the lives of those who are seeking Jesus or in the life of those who know Jesus. There are many needs. And we must be postured to be committed to the community development, to be committed to a culture of invitation and, and, and welcome, regardless of, of what people may, may bring in so that they can find salvation, restoration, a foundation in Jesus Christ. I ask you this question, responding to the need of man, does that change our method? Does it change our message? Does it change our mission? I would say maybe it changes our method, but the mission and the message never changes. The message is the gospel. The, message, the mission is to make disciples who are making disciples. But it might affect our method. Let me explain. I shared this with the diaconate. On a scale of 0 to 10, 0 representing someone who has no understanding of Jesus, 10 representing that they have actually stepped across the line of faith and they've received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. In the 1960s, do you know where the readiness of man's heart was? At about an 8 which is why methods then that were more event-driven, such as uh, evangelistic rallies, door-to-door -door witnessing, were all incredibly effective because in the 1960s, maybe even up close to the 80s, there was a readiness. People did not have to be taught from ground zero most of the time because there was a cultural, societal understanding, if not in large part, in small part, that God is real, 
and he sent his son Jesus, and now I need to decide what to do with Jesus. So our evangelism and outreach would look n not too much less than someone saying, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? And then you're able to witness. Not so today. Uh, most strategists and demographers tell us that we're in a post-Christian culture, which means that the readiness for someone to understand Jesus is not in an eight, but probably at a three. Probably at a three. Where in you would approach someone to talk about Jesus, and instead of saying, can I read to you from the Bible some truths, many people may say, what's a Bible? Or I've never really read the Bible. Why do you read one? This is what we're not only hearing, but this is what statistically we're seeing, that there is a law in man's understanding of God and who Christ is so that it does affect our message. So understanding the need of man is vital, and we understand that there's something the church must do to bring them into a full fellowship and understanding of Jesus. Now, just a couple of more conversations, and we'll go to our small groups. The fourth conversation, uh, prioritizing the necessity of truth. Prioritizing the, the necessity of truth. So if man is at a three in his ability to understand Jesus and God so that his heart's open to receive what the church is offering, then where is the truth and how do we bring the truth and how do we continue to live out the truth? Again, we're looking at how people are coming into the community and becoming a part of the body of Christ. Well, number one and first, the story must be told. The story must be told, but it must be told and repeated. The story must be told and repeated. I'm not saying that our preaching and our teaching should be shallow, but the story of the gospel must be told and retold and retold and retold. And it must be told with very careful attention to the understanding level of a post-Christian culture. If we are indeed a post-Christian culture, which means a readiness for someone to truly embrace Christ is no longer at a seven or eight, it's at a two or a three, then that means post-Christian. There is something the church must be doing that might look a little bit different than it did decades ago. So I, I want to focus for just a moment on questions 18 through 19. Small group leaders, you can look at that and possibly on even through questions 20 through 24. Uh, consider consider the, um, the difference between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. Peter's preaching to God-fearing Jews. All he had to do was stand up and say, here's what the prophet said. And then he carried it all the way to Christ. Paul stood up at the, uh, at the uh, Mars Hill assembly of Stoics and philosophers, and Paul couldn't start with the prophets because these were not God-fearing Jews. They were Greek cultured thinkers. And so Paul couldn't say, can I talk to you about the prophets? They may have said, Who's prophet? When did they live? There's a lot that we define with that word prophet. So Paul had to start at the very rudimentary level of, hey, you have a statue that says to an unknown God, can I tell you I've discovered his name? Okay, let's start there. <laughs> his name is God. He's the father of our Lord. So look at how basic Paul had to start with a culture that was not at an eight, but at a three. So... The story must be told repeated with careful attention to the understanding level of a post-Christian culture. I was invited to a private school just north of the town we lived in in Texas. I was invited there just months before I moved here to do a, a, a convocation assembly at this private school. We we're very good friends with some of the house parents there. and It's a very, it's a very astute, uh, academically driven uh, private school campus. And, and I was privileged to go there and, and lead in convocation. And I asked the headmaster, it's, a, it's not a Christian private school, but nonetheless private, so I asked the headmaster, uh, what are my limitations before I say yes? He said, well, we know you, we know your church, we know your family, there are no limitations. I said, then I'll, I'll be there. And so I stood up, and they introduced me, we, Dr. Ken Pruitt from Fairfield, Texas, is coming to speak, and I stood up, and I, you know, greeted everyone, faculty, staff, thank you for having me here. Students had already checked out. All they had to hear was, Dr. Ken Pruitt, and all I had to do was send him say, I'm honored to be here, faculty, thank you. I could look at these 10, 11, 12, checked out, gone. So when I realized I'd already lost my audience and I hadn't really said anything pertinent, 
I stepped to the side, looked down at them and said, y'all need to know something. There is an incredibly bad problem right here in this room, and we need to do something about it. <laughs> I think I saw one of them mouths. How did he find out? I'm, it's, a, you know, it's a bad problem. We've got to deal with it. Can I, can I tell you what the problem is and who's responsible? <sighs> Maybe. <laughs> and then I told them the gospel. And I don't think they ever lost the conversation. And it wasn't because uh, I excelled in communication 401, but it's because this is an unchurched, heightened post-Christian culture and the gospel and the reach and the connection and the time that it takes to bring someone into a fellowship so that you understand Jesus is going to look completely different than it did even 15 years ago. But the message and the mission never changes. Grace and truth must be expressed in every micro detail of the local church. Only then can the gospel become the grand narrative explained through the lives of God's people. Grace and truth must be a part of every micro detail of the church because only then can, can, can the grand narrative of what Jesus did on the cross be explained in the lives of God's people. Please hold on to that. The truth is necessary. John 1.17 tells it to us this way. The law was given through Moses. But let's heighten these two words. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If you're wondering what it means to prioritize the truth, let me just very quickly give you the triple antithesis found in this verse. Three things that are opposed. And not disrespectfully opposed, but clearly opposed. The law opposed to grace and truth. The means of how the law came. Given opposed to the word Moses opposed to the name Jesus Christ. The law with its demands and the coldness of its ardent directions and condemning nature because who is righteous enough to be perfect in the law is wonderfully opposed with grace and truth. Grace is the overwhelming flood of love Jesus gave you from the Father when he said, let this cup pass from me, and then said, it is finished. That's the grace. The truth is everything that Jesus accomplished for you and me in the new covenant when he said, it is finished. The redemption, the fullness, the joy, the righteousness whereby the law no longer condemns, but the law now tutors us to understand the importance of knowing Jesus and him being the fulfillment of all things. And then the name Moses, the lawgiver, the great leader of Israel, God's people, is juxtaposed to the name Jesus Christ. There's no other name. So what does the truth look like in our body? It must promote grace and truth in that it came, not given by man. It came through Jesus. The word came there means to be manifest. And that is our truth. So we now come to the last conversation and then we'll conclude. And here's the last conversation. Now, this will take us to discussion questions 25 through 26. And Scott, you can get ready to come and close us out, if you will, my brother. Recognizing the necessity of the local church and the urgency of the moment. All of this, as we talk about the community and what the community needs to do, and people come in from different needs, and we embrace their lives with the truth. It helps to recognize how necessary the local church is and how urgent this very moment is. And I want to prove that to you with two simple words. Time and space. The biblical conviction of time is expressed in this way. James 4.14, life is but a vapor. And I will tell you, church, if there's one visitor that has come into the walls of the church in the last month, and there have been many. Then time is of the essence. Because if we don't know where that family is that visited two weeks ago, and if we don't know the spiritual condition of that family, and yet they came and sat here and hugged our necks, 
then we have to say we're responsible. And we don't want to be aggressive about our follow-up. We just want to be sincere and genuine. And that is alive and well here. I'm grateful for that. This indication turns that heat up just a bit to say there is a moral and spiritual principle behind our follow-up. And it's this. Time is urgent. And we want them in this community so they can grow in faith and be one who is on mission for Christ. But then there's the biblical conviction of space. Acts 2, verse 46 through 44, the New Testament church went from house to house establishing favor with everyone. But you know what they did also? Let me just give you the reciprocating circles out from a New Testament Christian according to Acts chapter 2, verse 46 through 47. They faithfully attended the temple. Notice the size of the reciprocating circles. They faithfully attended worship in the temple. They were faithful in different houses, breaking bread, observing the Lord's Supper. And they were in favor with everyone. The mission of the church is not confined to Sunday morning worship. We all know that. But it is a vital, and yes, I'm about to say it, an absolutely necessary, non-negotiable part of discipleship. But there is also the mission in homes and in neighborhoods that's so incredibly and as necessary and very vital. And then there's the favor with all men. So there is the conviction of how urgent time is. Now's the time of salvation. Uh, Peter's epistle, the first epistle rings out. And the biblical conviction of space, the body of Christ is not limited to 873 Little Neck Road. The body of Christ is everywhere that we disperse to six days a week. And what we do in those six days as well as on the seventh can determine how contagious how vibrant, how real, and how necessary the proper development of community is in the body of Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Scott's going to come and dismiss us. and.